Stay tuned as I discuss how the changes in the credit card industry will impact Visa and MasterCard, and whether Palo Alto Networks is a good buy right now. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Wednesday, March 27th, 2024 edition of Invest Talk. I am host Justin Klein, and back with us today is Luke Guerrero. He was a bit under the weather. Did you have the market madness fever? Is that why you couldn't make it yesterday? You know, I went to the doctor and told them I believed I had market madness fever, and they said, Luke, you're being an idiot. That doesn't exist. I think you're going to be fine. And you know what? He was right. I was fine. Market madness fever does not make you sick. It makes you excited. I don't know. Maybe we should uh, write to Nature Magazine. They can publish uh, a report on you. And maybe it will be a thing, officially. But uh, either way, whether it's a fit, whether it is a thing or it isn't a thing, we're glad you're back with us, and we're going to run down today's matchups, sorry, tomorrow's matchups. And we're going to announce the winners of today's matchups right now. Uh, MTD, Mattel, Mettler Toledo International. That was, uh, that was the winner. Um, who did they match up against? I forgot who they who played, but they were the winner. Uh, Lou Lemon was against Gap. Uh, and Lulu Lemon was oversold. Gap was overbought and Lulu Lemon came through. So they were the winner uh, between those that matchup. EQH, Equity Holdings, continued to power higher with its momentum. And then lastly, Home Depot, obviously a cyclical name, been in an uptrend, was oversold going into yesterday and got a nice bounce today. So those were the winners of the consumer region in the second round of the Invest Talk Market Madness. Stay tuned and download every episode for in-depth analysis and daily results. Now, Luke... Our job here is to help our listeners become better investors, and we do that by answering their questions, giving them actionable material, running down the news of the day, and and trying to distill it all into something that they can take back to their own situation and make a decision. That's what this is all about, not just making one decision, not getting that one stock tip, but learning lessons consistently that help you uh, make those uh, good decisions consistently. Okay. Now we're going to run down the market performance for today and run down some show topics, but let's get to our first caller question now. Hey, Rob here from Wisconsin. Thanks for the show and uh, thanks for the education you provide us all. I was wondering if you could give me your opinion on Lumen Technologies, L U M N. I have it in a 401k long term hold. Is this company a hold still or or buy or sell. Just curious what your opinion is. Thanks, guys. Well, this is Lumen Technologies, and this is a name. This is a merger of Level 3 uh, back in 2017, and I believe it was – what was the name of the – before that? I forget the 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 the, uh, the bigger company before that, but uh, the the all their mergers throughout their time created a lot of debt, uh, a lot of great businesses, a lot of good cash flow, but also a lot of debt. And they've been trying to restructure their business. They've been uh, they've been attempting to. Uh, they've stayed in business so far, but this looks like it could be a, a bankruptcy candidate, and that would mean the equity is wiped out. Now the technicals have improved since November. Bottom to around eighty cents per share. Now we're at a dollar fifty eight. Um, but yeah, Lumen. Uh, you know, this is a high risk name. Uh, could they dig themselves out of it? Probably not. Um, but they do have some assets as a bondholder that I think could be valuable. Um, but I think the equity probably long term is no value. So I would just move on on Lumen. All right. Now we have a lot of ground to cover over the next forty five minutes, and our main focus point concerns this topic. What does history teach us that the Fed might make major mistakes? The Federal Reserve has prepared to lower interest rates this year, but they're careful not to repeat some past mistakes. So we're going to talk about how the Federal Federal Reserve uh, policy will evolve throughout this year, what they're looking out for, and what uh, lessons from the past can inform what they might do going forward. Also, we're going to touch on a couple other topics. One is... That caller yesterday asked about the Baltimore Bridge collapse, and I did a little more digging and what type of fallout there could be. Uh, I didn't have any off the top of my head because I don't 
frankly, I don't know much about the Baltimore uh, port, but it does have some significance. It's a, a top 10 port in the country, not nearly the biggest, but it has some importance, especially particular industries. So we're going to break down that. Also, uh, swipe fees. Swipe fees are being have been negotiated lower. Uh, a settlement for um, uh, for Visa and Mastercard, and what that could mean for the industry as a whole and small businesses, etc. So that's what's on the dock there. Uh, what else? We also have some voice bank questions. One is on Martin Transportation (MRTN) and Inspire Medical System (INSP). Now, Luke is back with us, and let's take a look at the market today. It was a very interesting, interesting day, Luke. We did fantastic uh, because the value side of the market uh, had a had a wonderful day. Pretty big dichotomy between large cap growth was actually down uh, six basis points, small cap value up two and a half percent, over two and a half percent. So uh, you, you saw the value side of the market really resurge here. And what was interesting, it was. It was not anything really about a big move in the dollar. Typically, you'd see the dollar down and maybe commodity price, commodity stocks up, things like that. But the dollar was actually marginally higher today. So small caps were up nearly 2%. Uh, the broad U.S. market was up uh, nearly 1%. So definitely a, a nice day. Uh, and we didn't get that follow-through from yesterday where the market closed on the lows. Uh, we definitely had a nice rebound day. Uh, but you did see a big, like I said, big divergence between the growth side and the value side of the market. And that's starting, that trend is starting to reassert itself. Like I've been talking about that really started in the fall and yet a kind of a snapback rally to start the year. Uh, But value in a higher interest rate environment, higher inflationary environment is starting to perform once again, which is kind of what you would expect. So that was the market today. Now, from time to time, we also receive Invest Talk questions from the YouTube comment section of our Invest Talk channel. Now, you can head over there. We will you can leave your question. We'll answer it on a future show. Jim Leahy says, "Do you think SPHY is a better alternative to T bills?" SPHY. That is an ETF. It's the S the Spiders Portfolio High Yield Bond ETF. Uh, I don't think it is, <laughs> frankly, because. This is a portfolio of high yield bonds. You're getting a better yield, yes, but the duration risk that you are taking is just way too high. So yeah, SPHY has effective duration of 3.2 years. And right here, you're chasing the yield, okay? Don't go chasing the yield. Chase profitability, not the yield. And, you know, in many ways, you're probably picking up uh, pennies in front of a steamroller, uh, long term, I think this will do better, but this is not an alternative to a safe investment. High yield bonds are not safe. They are risky. Okay. No matter what you say, they are definitely risky. So don't think of this as a, as, as a safe alternative. It's safer than equities, but it's not a, a, a true alternative to T-bills in any way, shape, or form. So I, I definitely wouldn't substitute this for cash. Thanks for the call. Now let's play another caller question now. Hi guys, I was calling about my little Alto T A N W. Just wanted to see what you guys thought about it. If it's worth buying or not. I don't own it yet. Thanks for your help. All right, looking at Palo Alto Networks. Palo Alto Networks. This is a name that fell on earnings back on February twenty first. And it fell from $363 down to a low of $261. Uh, it's bounced back a little, but frankly, this would be bearish consolidation. That's that's how you would look at this. It, it's really just bearish consolidation. And it's still trading at a high multiple, 53 times forward-looking earnings. And, and revenue growth is slowing. It was growing 30% a couple of years ago. Now it's only growing about 19%, which is still nice. But, you, you know, do, are you going to pay 50 plus times earnings for something like that? Absolutely not. Okay. So I I think that the technicals here uh, are telling you that you don't want to be buying this at these levels. Uh, you want to be very patient for a, a more durable bottom. And I think this is a name that's been trending up for a long period of time and just starting its correction to more reasonable valuations. And when that happens, you want to you wanna be patient. 
uh, and when the, and when you have this bearish chart pattern, you want to continue to be patient. Trading at 13 times price to sales ratio. Anytime that happens, that is a anytime that a stock is trading there, it really is a a a, a tough endeavor to make money on that type of name. So. Uh, I would pass on Palo Alto Networks, name that should be in your watch list, but needs to go much, much lower to make the valuation worth it. Now, let's go over to another YouTube question. Blake Pumphrey, 8782, says, I would like your opinion on H&E equipment, H-E-E-S, H-E-E-S. And this is provider heavy construction, specialized industrial equipment leasing across 120 different locations. I like that type of business, you know, in a world where many companies are reshoring their manufacturing, there's a lot of the new industrial policy, like the chips Act and the inflation reduction act that is incentivizing new building of manufacturing facilities. And obviously our infrastructure needs to be upgraded as well. And so there is a lot of demand for this type of equipment. Uh, it's at a 52 week high, the, the momentum is very good. Relative strength is at 91. It's about a $2.5 billion market cap. They have a little bit of debt on their balance sheet, but it's a capital intensive business, right? They're buying in a lot of this equipment and leasing it out. And they're very profitable. Return equity 37%, which, and, and I like that. So I'm going to give H&E Equipment and Services a thumbs up. That's H-E-E-S. Well, it looks like Luke uh, had to drop off for the rest of the show. Internet issues. You know how that goes these days. But our main focus point today concerns this topic. History teaches us that the Fed has made two major mistakes in the past. And the big question is, how will they avoid that in the future? Now, the first major mistake that they, they, they made over the last 100 plus years is the Great Depression. And they... You can see the reaction uh, post-financial crisis. And instead of tightening down on bank credit, they did the opposite. They did basically the opposite of, of what they did during the, the uh, Great uh, Depression. Uh, they stimulated the financial markets. They did QE. They, they, they reversed that deflationary impulse that was the financial crisis. Because Ben Bernanke the Fed chairman at the time, was not going to have a repeat of the Great Depression. In fact, he actually wrote, I believe, his uh, doc doctoral uh, dissertation on the Great Depression and how to avoid it. And so he knew the tools to turn to to really uh, turn things around. Um, and, and they, frankly, have been running that playbook, similar playbook, ever since. So anytime any time you know, they had trouble winding down Q, uh, QE, uh, post the financial crisis and then during COVID, they threw a bazooka at it. You know, about five times as much fiscal and monetary stimulus than we had post the financial crisis, and just shows you that they were erring on the side of more inflation than less inflation, because right they were scared of that deflationary impulse happening again. Now today they have a little bit different issue. Right, the economy, economic growth is humming along. Unemployment rate is low, sub 4%. And the current environment reminds, likely reminds them of their other major mistake that they made uh, over the last 100 years. And that was in the late 60s, which was to ease policy prematurely. And what that did was it allowed inflation to to really skyrocket, I don't say skyrocket, but certainly enter a, a sticky inflationary environment, which we're in to a degree, but not like the 70s, right? And so what they want to avoid is a scenario where they cut too soon, they uh, allow, they don't allow uh, inflation to truly land, uh, and it, it, it bounces back up. And you're already starting to see that to a degree. You saw that with um, you know their pivot in the fall. Uh, allowed the, the dollar to weaken, uh, financial conditions to to, we, to to ease. And what that did was that manifested in January and February, inflation surprising to the upside. And so it's clear that when they do pivot and they do 
uh, prognosticate an easing path going forward, then that does that starts to price into markets rather quickly, and that manifests in uh, easier financial conditions. And so they, then that's what was a bit shocking about this last meeting is that you know asset prices are near record highs, uh, depending on what index you're looking at. But you know by most in- indices. Uh, you also have, once again, inflation that's starting to bottom around the 3% level, which is about 100 basis points higher than their target. And so, you know, this is what they're trying to really avoid is that inflation genie uh, taking back off. You know, I think of it as a plane. If you're trying to land the plane, they brought inflation up to make sure that there wasn't a crash landing in the economy during the COVID crisis. And now they're trying to land the plane back gently onto the runway. But uh, it's likely that they are uh, a bit hesitant, right? Where they don't really want to risk a, 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 a landing or landing, a crash landing, shall we say, um, and a major recession. And so it's going to be very interesting to see if this economic data that continues to hum along, not amazing. Not terrible. You know, the in, in interest rate parts of the economy, those remain interest rate sensitive parts of the economy. Those remain a uh, challenge. But the rest of the economy is pretty good, right? 3.9% unemployment rate. So what this likely means is that they're going to be higher for longer. I know they're talking about three rate cuts by year end, but it just doesn't compute. It doesn't compute. If you're trying to get down to 2% and we're at three and the last two readings are headed higher, why would you waste bullets to potentially to potentially uh, uh, avoid a, a recession? In fact, history says, says that in order to get inflation to that goal, you're going to need at least a mild recession. So we'll see what this what actually happens, but those are the mistakes in the past that are coloring the Fed's thinking. They don't want to go too far one way or too far the other way. Right now, I think they are erring on the side of keeping rates higher. However, one thing I think they're not paying attention to is the amount of debt and how higher interest rates in some ways is inflationary. Think of all the money that people are earning on their cash uh, that they weren't earning before. That is effectively fiscal spending that's going out there in the economy. And so while they're looking to the past, they have to adjust their thinking a bit to the current realities, which is a very indebted government. Hi, Justin and Luke. This is Steve from Minnesota. Best wishes to Steve and his recovery. I was thinking that I need in my industrials a logistics company, and I've got a really small position in two right now. One is uh, Martin, M-R-T-N, and C.H. Robinson Worldwide, C-H-R-W, much bigger company. And I think it's got the better numbers as I look at them. I don't think I I need both. And if I want to select just one, I think C.H. Robinson, it's got better return on capital. It's got better free cash flow. The Martin uh, cash flow seems to be almost non-existent. Martin might have a better debt profile and lower debt. But see a drop and said, I don't think I'd see anything terrible about their debt profile. Analysts, for what it's worth, Wall Street analysts seem to disagree. The analysts who file, bar, bar, follow Martin rate it much higher. Curious what your thoughts are on that, that comparison and, and thought that I do need a logistics and, and only one logistics name. Appreciate uh, everything you do. And I look forward to hearing your answer. Thanks. Well, you might have answered your own question. You talked about the profitability of CH Robinson Worldwide, CHRW versus Martin Transport, MRTN. And both, you know, from a technical perspective, don't look very good. Uh, both are in the transportation space. Uh, Martin Transport focuses more on the uh, refrigerated trucks, right? Temperature sensitive truckloads, uh, et cetera. Uh, whereas CHRW, CH Robinson, much bigger name, about $8.7 billion market cap versus uh, Martin, which is only $1.5. Um, that one is your more traditional asset-based third-party logistics freight mover, 
uh, and they do that uh, via rail as well as truck uh, as well as air. Um, so historically, as you said, CH Robinson is much more profitable. Its return equity over the last five years is average around 30 something percent. A little lower now, but long term, its profitability has been much better. Martin Transport, it's fine. It's a fine business. There's nothing wrong with it, but its return equity is closer to the low teens. Fine, but not amazing. Now, yes, Martin Transport has very little debt, and CH Robinson has a little bit of debt, but nothing to worry about. So I wouldn't think of it in that respect uh, either. So um, I think it's pretty clear CH Robinson is better, but the technicals are poor for both. And frankly, I think there are better ones within the industry. I think you need to keep looking. I know if you have top of my head, obviously I can't tell you, but uh, I would keep looking within this industry and there are much better longer term performers with, I'll give you the hint, much higher stock price than what these are trading at. Uh, and so I would be looking at uh, a different name within this space because uh, I think you can certainly uh, do better. Look for some bigger names, okay? Thanks for the call. Now let's talk about the Invest Talk Market Madness contest and tomorrow's matchups. And this is the income region, so uh, typically not the most exciting names, but... Many of them have very good businesses. And the uh, next, the first matchup is AES. It's a utility, which we actually own for clients, uh, and Clorox, CLX. Now, AES was up uh, nicely today, and so was Clorox. Ooh, this one's tough for tomorrow. I'm going to go with AES, just that momentum's a bit better. Columbus McKidden, CMCO, is the next one, and Dominion Resources. Dominion Resources. Uh, Dominion, Dominion Energy is a utility company as well, whereas CMCO, a much smaller name, only $1.2 billion market cap. That is in the materials uh, handling business for commercial and industrial markets. Its momentum is very strong. Typically, is going to small caps, going to be more sensitive. Small caps did well today. I'm seeing a follow through day tomorrow. So I'll go with Columbus McKinnon as my winner for tomorrow. And then RHP is up against Kimberly Clark. So RHP Hospitality, it's a REIT that invests in resort properties. And it was, was it down today? No, it was up, up nicely today. It was oversold going into today. And Kimberly Clark, let's pull that up. KMB is the symbol, KMB. That is, uh, as everyone knows, that is uh, your company that makes your toilet paper probably your paper towels in your kitchen etc and so uh a, kind of a, a boring name up nicely today but did fade throughout the day and so because of that fading momentum throughout the day i'm going to go with rhyme and hospitality for tomorrow and then lastly you have one oak which is a name that we've owned for clients for a long period of time in the income division and it pays a nice dividend relative strength 82 five percent dividend yield uh, the momentum is pretty strong, and it's going up against Marathon Pete's Corporation, MPC, Mar Marathon Petroleum. There we go. Sorry. Um, and uh, oil is also doing well. Uh, which one am I going to go with? They're both in the oil space. MPC was down a little bit, whereas OKC, OKE, excuse me, was up today. I'm going to go with OKE, just that momentum play heading into tomorrow. But we shall see. This is the end of the second round tomorrow and monday market is closed on friday monday we're gonna have a double matchup of the sweet 16 between the new and the old economies so we'll get to those matchups tomorrow now let's pivot over and talk a bit about uh, the bridge collapse in baltimore uh we had that caller yesterday and frankly i was blindsided I had a busy day yesterday didn't really get in, be able, didn't have time to really get into the ramifications of the bridge collapse. Uh, and now I've read up a little bit on it and I'll bring the, you know, this news to you. And what's interesting about the Baltimore port is that it is a top 10 port in the United States by container volume. But 
there are many other larger ports on the East Coast nearby. The Port of New York and New Jersey both uh, will probably get a lot more box ship traffic uh, now that the Baltimore one is shut down for time. They don't really have a timetable on when it will return. But what's interesting is there are a few key a few key uh, products that are imported and exported out of this Baltimore uh, port. And the first one would be coal, coal shipments. Trades about 22.9 million metric tons of, of coal. Uh, that was last year in 2023. And so most of this is going for power generation, India, China, and Europe. And it represents 27% of all seaborne coal exports in the United States. And the most affected companies, Console Energy, they import, they export their coal producer. They export a lot of their coal out of this port. And CX, which is uh, CSX, excuse me, the railroad company. And they're the ones that, you know, uh, are, are bringing the, the coal from the mines to this terminal. And so they were both down pretty big yesterday. And they're the go- going to be the ones that, that are most affected you know, long term, I think they'll, they'll they'll fix this issue. So, you know, maybe this is a buying opportunity in both of those names. Uh, but a lot of those shipments uh, will go to larger coal exporting hub, uh, which will be in North Norfolk, Virginia. So some of that will be able to be rerouted. Um, so just a heads up there. Uh, the biggest import of that port is actually raw sugar, raw sugar, the Domino sugar refinery is one of the largest in the United States. It produces about 6 million pounds of refined sugar daily. Now, I'd argue, you know, sugar, it's not very good for you. So it's probably a good thing for the country to have a little bit less sugar. But uh, the owner of this refinery says that they have stockpiles for at least a couple of weeks, uh, and they can reroute stockpiles from warehouses uh, across the country and other U.S. refineries. So it probably won't have a large impact on the sugar market. Uh, they'll just have to do without some uh, stockpiles for a little while. And remember, sugar doesn't really go bad, so it's it can it can uh, it's it's easy to have a lot of inventory on hand. Uh, one of the main uh, functions of this port, when it comes to large machinery, is actually uh, autos, trucks, tractors, wheeled cranes. It's East Coast's biggest port for handling what are called row rows, roll on and roll off cargo. So, you know, nothing you're putting in a big box, you're just putting it on the ship and it's going to roll off and and roll on, right? And so uh, that could be disrupted kind of in the near term. But that's about it so far that we've that we figured out. It hasn't really, uh, it's not really going to have, I think, a lasting impact. Uh, these are things that they'll eventually clear the debris after they... Uh, do their best to find any survivors. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, this will probably be a functional port by summertime. So, you know, could there be short term effects? Yes, but I don't think there's any long term uh, changes that this brings about in the markets or particular industries. Okay. Now, 2024 is humming along nicely. And guess what? We are almost through the third, the first quarter, only one day, one train day left. Friday is a holiday and Monday is the first. So the question is, how'd you do this first quarter? It was a very interesting quarter. We started the quarter off strong on the, you know, the AI craze and the tech names. And by mid quarter that started to wane and the value side of the market started to research materials, industrials, energy, uh, financials, commodities in general. Uh, so, you know, which one is likely to be the outperformer? Well, frankly, if you look based on what's happened to close the year, it is that value side and that big move you saw today. And these things can happen pretty fast. And so the question is, your portfolio fit for these new trends that now are are emerging once again? They emerged in 2022. You had a bit of a pause through most of last year, emerged a bit again here to start this year, but the general trend remains. An inflationary environment, value side of the market wins out. In normal market environments, the value side of the market wins out. It's only in times where you have financial repression, very low interest rates that typically 
is when those sexy growth names uh, get, get their outperformance and, and that is, is behind us. And so if you need help understanding whether your portfolio is aligned with these times, I encourage you to reach out to us at our website, investtalk.com. Just click on the portfolio review button on the top right-hand part of the screen. Fill that out and we'll get back to you and set up a free portfolio review assessment. Justin and Luke calling about Warner Brothers, WBD. The stock has been beaten up for, for quite some time. It's in the low eights now, I believe it's trading at. And uh, I'm kind of interested in possibly getting in and uh, adding a small position. I think uh, it's got some upside potential, whether that be management changes or acquisitions or or something. And wanted to get your thoughts. I'm looking forward to hearing your answer on the show and uh, love what you guys do. Thank you. Are right, looking at Warner Brothers Discovery WBD? This is the spinoff and 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 merger uh, from AT and T. Remember they bought w- Warner uh, Media and then realized they should own it. And they spun it off and in, in conjunction with Discover and trying to kind of consolidate all of their brands from CNN to TNT, TBS, Discovery, HGTV, the Food Network, and HBO. Um, and the issue here, though, is that they spun them off with a lot of debt. It fixed it. It, it helped uh, AT and T kind of unload unload a lot of their debt. Um, but Warner Brothers has been kind of struggling, especially in this new media environment where a lot of cord cutting. And frankly, I think management is not very good. And I'll point to one thing: that is dropping the name HBO from HBO Max. I think that was one of the dumbest business decisions I've seen in my career. HBO is historically one of the best producers of new original content there is. And they don't lose that, but they lose that brand, that brand. What, what, what's Max? I don't know what Max is. I know what HBO is. So why would you drop Ma- HBO? Drop Max. Just go back to HBO. It was so dumb. Um, so, you know, I think they have a lot of value, but I, I just don't know if I think the management is smart enough to navigate through this difficult environment uh, where, and, and especially a company that has so much debt, $43 billion in long-term debt on their balance sheet. And yes, they have good cash flow. Six billion trailing twelve months, so I don't think they're going to go bankrupt anytime soon. But guess what's going to happen to your to the shareholder? All of that cash flow is going to be used not to pay you a dividend, not to buy back stock. It's going to be going to the uh, bondholders in order to uh, write the balance sheet, and they could eventually get there. But on a twenty-one billion dollar market cap, forty. $3 billion in long-term debt. I just, I just don't see it. And then you got on top of that, the chart, the chart is in a clear downtrend. 10 is the relative strength. 10, it means 90% of companies are doing better over the last year. So until there's some technical improvement here and the balance sheet gets right-sized even more, I'm going to pass on Warner Brothers. So I'm going to keep an eye on because I think there's value there, but I wouldn't buy it anytime soon. Hello, Justin. Luke. I'm calling to see you guys' thoughts on Onto Innovation, ticker symbol O-N-T-O. I'm actually an employee and get a 15% discount on the stock within the ESPP program that my job provides. I've taken some profit off the table um, within the last couple of years and including this year, but I was wondering if I should trim more or hold off. It's a small position in one of the different portfolios of my account. Uh, so I was wanted to know what you guys think. Thanks. Are right, looking at Onto Innovation, as the caller knows, in the semiconductor menu, semiconductor equipment manufacturing space. And it's, it's doing well. It's a, it's growing nicely in $1.23 in 2017. And next year, it's supposed to earn $5.91. It's pretty much been consistent uh, grower of profits ever since. Had a down year last year, but... Uh, supposed to bounce back this year, and that's good. Uh, however, big however, it's trading at pretty egregious valuations. 11 times price sales ratio, enterprise value to EBITDA in the 45 range. That's very high. 
and its return equity is seven percent. It's a good, you know, profitable business, but uh, not amazing. And its market cap is eight point eight billion, and it's only doing about one hundred fifty million in free cash flow. It's not a very good free cash flow yield. That's yes, less than two percent. Now they have a clean balance sheet. That's good. Uh, but the technicals are starting to wane here. It did peak out like a lot of semiconductor stocks in early March, uh, right around $200 per share. Now we're at a do- 180, so down 10%. Uh, you know, look at NVIDIA down today. This stock was only up one cent uh, in a day when small and mid caps did very, very well. So you're seeing that, once again, rotation, that lack of uh, follow through to the upside and momentum. So I think this is a good time to take some chips off the table, pun intended, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't be buying more at this time. I'd definitely be uh, more of a seller. Thanks for the call. Now, lastly, let's talk about Visa and MasterCard. And they just agreed to a settlement with merchants that have been suing them for nearly two decades over their swipe fees. And it's not a big concession, but it's something. And it allows it, it forces them to lower all their rates for swipe fees by four basis points for three years. And then an average rate across the network to be lowered by seven basis points, so 0.07% for five years. Now, the average right now is around 2%. So you can see this is not a big concession. It's it's pretty minor, right? You're going from uh, 200 basis points, they're dropping at seven basis points. So it's still going to be, you know, around 190, 195 basis points uh, per transaction, which doesn't sound like a lot. But it is a lot when you uh, when you're talking billions of dollars uh, in, in in transactions, trillions of dollars in transactions. In fact, the network and banks collected seventy two billion dollars in these interchange fees last year alone, and so this could uh, eliminate about thirty billion dollars in fees over five years. So about six billion dollars per year, which is not nothing, right? And I think most importantly, what this allows smaller businesses to do is to form groups to negotiate swipe fees. So what a lot of large retailers do with them today. So uh, I think this could put pressure uh, across their entire system from from these merchants. And there are other battles that they're dealing with. Okay, U.S. senators are pushing legal or legislation to give merchants the ability to process Visa, MasterCard, credit cards over other payment networks. There are also a bill aiming to cap interchange fees on credit cards, very similar to what they've done with debit cards. And the Justice Department has been asking for documents from them about their debit card fees in an antitrust investigation. And so you're starting to see some weakness in Visa and MasterCard. And I think uh, you know th- these are names that have traded 30 plus times for looking earnings. So there's a very large premium that they're trading for in the marketplace. And, you know, with the work that's going on in crypto and uh, the Fed now system that the Federal Reserve is, is working on, you know, I think there are just in the future going to be a lot more alternatives to Visa and MasterCard networks. And, you know, what's happening with uh, Capital One buying Discover uh, and trying to create an alternative kind of similar to what Amex has done. Uh, that's certainly uh, in play as well. So I, I see this as a very big potential problem for the visas, for Visa and MasterCard. Um, and I think it's better for consumers, but obviously, if you have exposure to those names, there's a lot of potential downside. Now, I've been saying this for a while, frankly, um, but I think the heat is continuing to ramp up. Now, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening. We encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night. Invest Talk is a trademark of KPP Financial. Because of the nature of the interactive dialogue inherent in the format of this program, it's important for the listener to understand that not all comments made will apply to them. Specifically, nothing said shall be taken to be investment advice, or shall statements on this program be considered an offer to buy or sell security. Because such advice is rendered solely on an individual basis, and at times will require that the investor review a prospectus before investing. Invest Talk is a copyrighted program of Klein, Pavlis, and Peasley Financial, a registered investment advisor firm which retains all rights. For more information regarding KPP's investment advisors, call 1-800-557-5461.
Steve Peasley is president and Justin Klein is chief executive officer of Klein, Havlis, and Peasley Financial. Thank you for listening, and your comments and questions are welcome on our 24-hour listener line at 888-99-CHART.